right. So you should be walking on the on the on the ceiling, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> What's that? Oh, okay. Mm, that's All right. You found one, yeah. <laughs> He's alive. He's alive. Okay. Keep him there. Keep him there. All right. Just. Just. <laughs> all, right. all right, hold him there, okay? Just keep him there. Just reassure him, pat him on the shoulder. Okay. Tell him to keep drinking the water. water. Where's water? Drink, Drink it, it, buddy. Drink it. What's, What's your, your name? name? Harrison. Harrison. Okay, okay, Harrison. My, My name, name is Colby. Colby. Okay, okay, and I'm going to bring you home, home, okay? What is, what is, what is, what is your, your rank? rank? <laughs> You're the, the cook. cook. Yeah, we'll survive. Put, Put your, your head, head under water and breathe comfortably, okay? Okay, how's that? Are you all right, Harrison? Harrison? All, right, all right, stick, stick his, his head, head in. Put his head in the bell. How are you in the bell, Harrison? Give me a thumbs up. Good, Good job, job, my, my friend. friend. Well, well done. done. You're a survivor. Ah. Today's cruise on the dark side will take us this time on a ship. How fitting. A ship sailing on the Atlantic Ocean, about 32 kilometers off the Nigerian coast. That ship was a tugboat called the Jackson 4. Used to push or pull other marine vessels, many in that region mainly big oil tanks. The job was risky and routinely put them in dangerous situations between the high and predictable seas and the constant risk of explosions, but it was part of the job description. Well, for all 11 crew members, beside Harrison Okeni, 29, who was the cook and sole job was to feed the crew and make sure not to get them sick. Okeni? was from Wari town in Nigeria, newlywed to Akpovona, 27. His days on the ship were similar and repetitive, waking up early in the morning at about 5 a.m., cleaning up however he could in the small cabin spaces, to then go to the kitchen and start his daily work, prepping food for the rest of the crew. But he didn't expect what was going to happen to him. Close your doors, turn your lights off, and let's get started. On May 26, 2013, a massive hulking tanker, several hundred foot long, was being thrown about by massive ocean swells, crushing waves and a relentless, battering rainstorm that had no end in sight. Part of a 3 billion industry that extracted 238,000 gallons of crude from the ocean depths every year, packed with massive amounts of petroleum and gasoline that was just extracted from the nearby Chevron oil platform. So to avoid any man-made disaster, the Jackson 4, along with two other tugboats, were contracted by the company to stabilize that big tanker and tow it out of trouble. It was a vital mission. So that day, very early morning, as usual, Okene woke up, in his underpants, still half asleep, barely opening his eyes, he headed to the bathroom. While sitting on the toilet, he felt a sudden drop, and everything went pitch black. In a matter of seconds, with a pull and speed so strong, everything was upside down, and the toilet fell on his head. A huge wave just smashed on the side of the Jackson 4, cracking pieces of the hull and flipping the tug over on its side. Okene heard people shouting from outside, Is this vessel sinking or what? He could feel the vessel going down, filling up with water, very, very fast. He kept hearing the crew outside struggling to find life-saving equipment or something to hold on to. He could hear their desperate cries for help. God help me! God help me! 
but after a short while, he couldn't hear anything anymore. Trying not to waste any time, he needed to act fast. So he pulled his undergarment back on and tried to find a potential escape. But he was trapped below decks, with his only way out blocked by deadly rushing water. Fighting against the current flooding into the passageway, he ended up in the ship's officer's cabin. The water continued to rush in, forcing Okene back into the bathroom that joined the captain's room, hurling him up against the wall as the entire tugboat continually pounded with waves and taking on unsustainable amounts of water, slowly sinking towards the bottom of the sea. The Jackson 4 could not survive the tempestuous waters, beaten by the sea and turned over, in a matter of minutes, the boat sank and settled upside down on the bed of the sea, 30 meters below the surface. Only, somehow, Okene didn't drown. He swam towards the ceiling of the cabin, which was the original floor, and found himself in a four-foot bubble of breathable air. Hanging on to the base of the overturned sink to hold himself above water, he was trapped. But quickly, his muscles started tightening under his effort to stay above the freezing water, so he decided to try and find something. Diving to the cabin, he managed to find mattresses and other articles to pile them up and build a sort of platform on which he could stand and keep his body partially above water to delay hypothermia. But afraid the water would fill up the space, he decided to close the toilet door to delay it and try to have as much air while waiting for the rescue team. But right when he was pulling the cabin door shut, he saw three bodies floating. Three of his colleagues were dead, he thought. Probably the same ones he saw trying to escape, but were blown away by a massive wave. He prayed for them, for himself, and for the rest of the crew, believing they were safe, not aware that in reality they were all dead, and he was the only survivor. That is how, with a can of coke as only source of food, and a flashlight that gave up after a day, no drinkable water, limited oxygen, and virtually no hope, he was going to stay 62 hours, almost three days, alone, underwater, in total darkness. If that wasn't enough of a nightmare for anyone, claustrophobic or not, the worst was about to come. On the surface, Nigerian rescue crews received the mayday from the Jackson 4, but with the storm raging and the rapidity with which the vessel plummeted to the sea, there was no chance of mounting a timely rescue operation. Even once the weather cleared later that day, there was still the relatively noticeable problem that the ship was upside down at a depth that even highly trained professional scuba divers aren't recommended to remain at for more than 20 minutes at a time. It was simply too dangerous, even for rescue swimmers. So Okene was alone, abandoned, buried alive. The first two days, Okene spent his time praying, alternating between moments of hope and moments of complete fatality, thinking that was it. It was the end. As time passed, even though he couldn't see anything, he could perceive the dead bodies of the crews nearby. He could smell them. After some time, he started hearing big noises, as if someone or something was entering the boat. So he started knocking on the door, hoping they could hear him. But eventually he focused more on the noises, which sounded more like a fight. Then he understood with the smell of the blood filling up his small space. There were big fish, maybe sharks or barracudas, eating the bodies, the bodies of his friends, fighting over their meal. After some time still, it was back to complete silence. The more time passed, the stronger the smell of the rotting flesh became, but his body itself was collapsing. After so many hours in the salt water, his skin was peeling off. He was so dehydrated and hungry. There in the dark, 
as the horror of his predicament began to sink in, Okane could do little but pray. All around me was just black and noisy. I was crying and calling on Jesus to rescue me. I prayed so hard. I was so hungry and thirsty and cold. I was just praying to see some kind of light. He kept praying, remembering the verses of the Bible his wife had sent him the night before. His wife that he thought he would never see again. On the third day, while Okene was giving up, stopped praying down on that ocean bed, thinking it had been a few hours, disoriented and losing all notion of time, while the families of the crew were crying and mourning their dead husbands, brothers and sons, since everyone assumed and believed they were dead and declared as such, a diving team from a Dutch company, DCN, was sent to recover the bodies. Officers on that mission, including Paul MacDonald and divers, were equipped with cameras and in contact with the captain of the mission through microphones. They were able to recover a few bodies, four to be precise, when suddenly one of the divers felt something touching him. Like seeing a ghost, the diver felt a hand touching his neck from behind, then waving at him when he turned around, trying to catch his attention. First shocked, scared, not knowing what to do, he froze, but quickly, with the help of his crew, understood there was a survivor and started setting up the complex rescue mission. Okene, on his side, was stuck for days. The loneliness, silence and darkness, he wasn't trained to survive under such conditions. Made worse by the worrying sounds in the boat, the animals, the waves and just the sort of weird silence that was going around, the dark emptiness that was filling every inch of the space he was trapped in. After days of praying, after hoping for a miracle, then giving up completely, accepting his faith, he was finally given a sign when he suddenly heard the sound of a boat, a hammering on the side of the vessel, and then, after a while, saw lights and the rising of water around him bubbling. He knew it had to be a diver, but he was on the wrong end of the cabin. Rescue seemed imminent, but then the lights disappeared. Desperate, Okene swam through pitch dark waters in the sunken boat to grab the diver, but he couldn't find him, and with the air in his lungs given out, he swam back to the cabin that held his precious but dwelling pocket of air. He came in, but he was too fast. So I saw the light, but before I could get to him, he was already out. I tried to follow him in the pitch darkness, but I couldn't trace him. So I went back, he said. But when the diver returned, Okene had to swim again to reach him. He knew that. He knew it was his last chance. But still the diver did not see him. He didn't expect to see a survivor. So Okene decided to gently tap the diver back trying not to scare him. Despite his attempt, the diver started screaming, corpse, corpse, a corpse, into his microphone, reporting up to the rescue vessel. The diver, sending his hand forward in order to grab the hand of the body, was shocked when he felt a tug and froze, not believing what was happening. When he brought his hand close to me, I pulled on his hand, Okene said. He's alive! He's alive! He's alive! Okene remembers hearing, pulling him back with him to his small air bubble so he could breathe. Okene described a surreal scene after the diver emerged into the air pocket. I knew when he gave me water he was observing me to see if I was really human because he was afraid. The diver first used hot water to warm him up, then attached him to an oxygen mask and the rescue mission had to be put in place, which was a challenge in itself. After such a long time at depth, Okene had absorbed potentially fatal amount of nitrogen. Bringing him suddenly to the surface would induce a deadly attack of the bends. The team needed to skillfully readjust the gas levels in Okene's body, while keeping him calm at all times to avoid sudden rises in his heartbeat. 
so they avoided upsetting news and kept him calm, even though his school was the most surprising for Paul and his crew. The second issue was the pressure difference. But finally, at 7.30 p.m. on May 28th, they suited Okene with a diving helmet and guided him to a diving bell designed to maintain internal pressure. Exhausted, starving, and dangerously dehydrated, Okene used his last ounces of strength to swim out of the wreckage. Despite losing consciousness during the transfer, he managed to survive. The bell then brought him safely to the surface, where he spent two days in a decompression chamber, then headed to the hospital. The time he spent trapped and managed to survive is considered to be the longest ever recorded, but that experience didn't come without consequences. Traumatized by what he lived, he suffered from nightmares. His wife said he still suffers nightmares even seven months later. When he is sleeping, he has that shock. He will just wake up in the night saying, Honey, see, the bed is sinking. We are in the sea, Mrs. O'Kenny said. But to top it all, until the moment he was finally out of danger, he believed most of his crew were able to escape and he was the only one trapped. They told me all the others had died and I cried because I thought I was the only one who had been trapped in the boat. Accused by his own community of using black magic to survive with such improbable odds, a miracle really. Even the rescue team doesn't understand how that bubble of air could have been formed. Paul MacDonald later wrote on his Facebook wall, how it wasn't full of water is anyone's guess. I would say someone was looking after him. Suffering from survival guilt, he didn't go to the funerals of his colleagues because he feared their family's reaction, Nigerians being generally very religious but also superstitious. I couldn't go because I didn't know what the family would say, thinking why is he the only one to survive? Every week I ask God why only me? Why did my colleagues have to die? Okene said he made a pact with God when he was at the bottom of the ocean. When I was under the water, I told God, if you rescue me, I will never go to the sea again. Never. Although Okene swore never again, he became a certified commercial diver in 2015. The rescue diver who discovered him at the bottom of the ocean presented him with his diploma. These days, he's a cook, but only on solid grounds. Of the 11 crew members aboard the tugboat when it sank in rough seas, 10 bodies have been found dead. One remain is still missing. And until next time, stay safe.